Gentlemen, I want to welcome you to the uh, Spurlock. Um, if you haven't had a chance to take a look at our uh, remarkable collections, uh, uh, you know, come back and, and do that. Uh, it really is quite a, a, a jewel on our campus here. But I'm also the chair of the George A. Miller Committee, and uh, in that particular office, I am happy to welcome you to today's lecture, which is one of a series of major public events named in honor of Professor George A. Miller, who was a noted mathematician who taught at the University of Illinois during the first half of the 20th century. He was a quiet and unassuming man, uh, devoted to the university, and at his death in 1951, he left his estate to the campus, quote, to be used for educational purposes other than current general operating expenses. The estate showed that while he had always lived a, a simple and modest life, he had also been a very good investor. The estate amounted to nearly a million dollars, which was quite a considerable sum back in 1951. The Miller Committee series began shortly after that as one of several ways to honor Professor Miller's wishes. So our lecture today is hosted by the Women and Gender and Global Perspectives program. It is co-sponsored by a huge range of campus units that you will see listed on the flyer. Uh, take a look at that list, you get a, a good sense of how much interest uh, there has been in this speaker and his topic. We thank them all for their support. Our next MillerCom lecture will be held on Wednesday, October 29th at 4 p.m., also here at the Spurlock Museum, when Professor Stathis uh, uh, Klaivas of Yale University will give a lecture entitled, What Varies and What Does Not Across Civil Wars. So I hope you can come and join us for that as well. So now let us turn to today's guest, uh, Professor Timothy Noah. To begin, I will turn the podium over to Professor Colleen Murphy, who is Associate Professor of Philosophy and also the Director of the Women and Gender in Global Perspectives program. Colleen. Thanks very much. So I'd like to welcome you all to this event today. The Women and Gender and Global Perspectives program is delighted to be hosting this event and coordinating the Illinois Inequality Initiative. And we're very pleased to have Mr. Timothy Noah on campus as part of that initiative, as well as the MillerCom Distinguished Speaker Series. The Illinois Inequality Initiative is co-organized by myself, Noreen Chagru from WGGP, Paolo Gardoni from Civil and Environmental Eng Engineering, and Monica McDermott from Sociology. It focuses on the moral significance of inequalities associated with national and international issues, such as higher education and climate change, as well as the causes, consequences, and possible solutions to these inequalities. Mr. Noah's talk is the initiative's first event of the academic year and the first in the education segment. At this time, I have the distinct honor of introducing Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs and Provost Adeshida, who will offer some brief opening remarks. Thank you very much, Colin. And thanks to everybody for being here this afternoon. My name is Adeshida, and uh, I've been on campus for many, many years. And this is actually the first time I've had this opportunity to introduce uh, a Millicombe Millicom speaker. This is uh, a germane topic for the time, a germane topic for our institution, and a germane topic for the nation. Why are we holding this uh, lecture today, as uh, Colin said? It's because Illinois is very committed, very, very committed to ensuring access, to ensuring access to education to students from all socioeconomic backgrounds. 
higher education, not only in this country, but everywhere in the world, has always been historically a social economic equalizer, the game changer for people. But over the last few decades, and in fact, we're seeing it in our institution, that things are changing. It's, like it's changing. Inequality issues are making a change. It's important to understand the change and the consequences that it may have on institutions like this. Because when you look at institutions like ours, we produce a lot of people. We grow people for this nation. We're the bedrock and the workhorse to produce manpower for this country. That's very important. When you look at um, the last century, 20th century in particular, institutions like this were economic equalizers. But now, because of decreasing, rapidly decreasing support, and increasing cost, the decreasing support from the state, and increasing cost of our institutions, access is being jeopardized. When I travel around and meet um, alumni of our institution, one thing they never forget to mention is what Illinois meant in their lives, in terms of being from a village somewhere around here, come to Illinois, and this became their platform to engage the world. And they've gone out to do great things. And in fact, many of them have changed the world, although they are from the background, very, very low income, before they come to this campus. So for us to remain a truly universal educational center for people and to ensure diversity, we talk about diversity in many multidimensional aspects. And on this campus, diversity for us is a platform for excellence. You need to bring people, different people from maybe ethnic groups, different backgrounds in terms of uh, socioeconomic background to the table to really contribute and make the best things happen. It's when you bring people together that you make magic happen. So universities, along with government and private sector, influence, they do influence and they are a force for mitigating inequality rather than perpetuating them. So how do we understand this? Today's talk is designed to ensure that students, staff, faculty, and the general public acquire a greater grasp of the issues involved in making universities accessible to students across the socioeconomic spectrum, as well as provide fostered educational experience to all who attend. I will tell you my own personal story that I'm from a village in Nigeria. I'm the first to ever go to school in my family, period. My parents never went to school and were poor. But the government of the day, at least in my part of the country, was insistent that people of my generation go to school. And I've seen that in one generation it has changed many, many lives, including mine. So this is an extremely important subject to me personally, because I've lived it, and I want to make sure that things that I've seen in my lifetime, and that the changes that have been wrought in my life, that has brought to my life, is available to many people, to many, and to many, many people from very different backgrounds. So thank you very much, Tim, for coming today, to come and give us this talk, and I now like to call Professor Tim Timothy Akathi to introduce the speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Adi. And good afternoon. I'd like to begin by adding my own thanks to the MillerCon co-sponsors since my name appeared at the bottom of the letter asking for their help. Today's lecture attracted a lot of support around campus for which the Inequality Initiative is deeply appreciative. This is the kickoff event in the education segment of the initiative, as Colleen mentioned. In the next two years, we'll be hearing from a variety of academic specialists working on problems of educational inequality, 
For the purpose of introducing the topic, however, we were looking for a salient writer in the general field that could place problems of inequality in higher education in the context of broader issues about socioeconomic inequality in the United States. And looking around the landscape in this area, one source and one author stood out. Tim Noah's book, The Great Divergence, published in 2012, constitutes what may well be the single best introduction to problems of socioeconomic inequality in the United States. It has deeply informed the discussion of surrounding issues for the past couple of years or so. We were very pleased when Tim accepted our invitation to be the lead speaker for this part of the initiative. Tim Noah was educated at Harvard College where he received a BA in English in 1980. Early in his career, he was assistant managing editor at US News and World Report a Washington reporter for the Wall Street Journal, a congressional correspondent for Newsweek. Uh, Tim has been a lead columnist for the New Republic, wrote for Slate for a dozen years, was a regular contribute to the, uh, contributor to the Washington uh, Monthly, uh, and a contributing writer for MSNBC. In his spare time, he's also been a regular contributor, uh, contributor to the CBS Sunday Morning News program. He's currently labor policy editor for Politico. For the series in Slate uh, that was the basis of the Great Divergence, uh, Tim received the 2011 Hillman Prize, the highest award for public service magazine journalism. With that kaleidoscopic rendition of journalistic accomplishments and destinations, I conclude this brief introduction. It's a pleasure to welcome Timothy Noah. Wonderful introduction. Can, can people hear me all right? <clears throat> you can hear me all right. That's good. Okay. Um, so thank you, uh, Tim and Adi and uh, Wayne and Colleen for those uh, introductory remarks. Um, delighted to be here and to talk about um, my favorite subject, uh, income inequality. Um, it's depressing, but it's fascinating. And um, I have been obsessed with it for uh, the last four years, ever since I wrote the series for Slate. And I'm uh, kind of continuing my exploration of, of the subject in my new job as labor editor at Politico, where um, I will be leading a team of four reporters, including myself, uh, writing about the world of labor and the workforce at a time when the American worker is in serious trouble. And I'm, I'm delighted that um, I'm going to have that opportunity to do that. Um, this is a, a present, I am a writer, I'm a word guy, but I have found um, that it is very hard to talk about these trends in income inequality without pictures. Uh, so I have uh, very reluctantly uh, uh, become a convert to the PowerPoint. Um, uh, I, I, like many people, I made uh, terrific fun of PowerPoint presentations right up until the moment that I decided that I had to make them all the time. Um, if, if you haven't looked up on, on the internet the PowerPoint version of uh, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, it's, uh, it's a hoot. Um, this is working. Okay, we are talking today about the Great Divergence. What is the Great Divergence? The Great Divergence is uh, the growth in income inequality since 1979. Um, now, some people think that income, growing income inequality is a standard feature of capitalism. That's not true. How do we know that's not true? We know it's not true because uh, in the United States uh, from the 19, early 1930s to the late 1970s, incomes in the United States were growing more equal rather than less so. And that trend reversed itself in 1979. Since 1979, we have seen incomes grow more unequal um, rather than less so. Uh, this great divergence is not a single trend, it is two trends. Something that um, is not always made clear in discussions of this subject. There are two things happening at the same time. 
The first thing that's happening is probably uh, the part you've heard about um, from uh, the Occupy movement. Uh, the top 1% uh, in the income distribution, and that would be uh, families currently uh, uh, exceeding uh, $394,000 in income, uh, that 1% doubled its share of the nation's income uh, after 1979 from 10% to 22%. That is trend one. Trend two is the people who lacked uh, a college degree or increasingly a graduate degree have seen their incomes increase much more slowly than people who had college or graduate degrees. And often they saw those incomes increase not at all. So we're going to start with um, the easy part of the story, which is the 1% inequality story, which, uh, as the illustration demonstrates, is all about Mr. Monopoly. Um, let's look at this chart here. Um, the green patch at the top shows income share for the top 1% over time from 1940 to 2008. Um, note that it thins after 1940, and it stabilizes in 1973, when the top 1% consumed 8% of the nation's income. Then, starting in 1979, you see the green patch starts to thicken, and by 2008, the top 1% is consuming 18% of the nation's income. Uh, since then, i.e. as of 2012, it's grown to 22%. Um, so just to uh, be clear, that green patch, uh, the thinner it gets at the top, the more income equality we have. The fatter it gets, the more income inequality we have, uh, specifically with regard to the percentage of the nation's income going to the top 1%. And here's another <clears throat> chart showing the same thing. Uh, and here you see it more clearly broken down into two historic periods, which have been called the Great Compression from about 1932 to 1979. And that it's called the Great Compression because incomes were becoming more equal. And then the Great Divergence not my coinage, it's the coinage of uh, Paul Krugman, uh, which began in 1979 and continues today. Uh, the one person, we had a recession a few years ago, you may recall, from 2007 to 2009. Um, what happened to the 1% during that recession? Uh, recessions are bad for rich people. Um, they're actually great for equality, but um, it's one hell of a way to get more equality, and it's a very temporary phenomenon. Uh, during the recession, the top 1% absorbed 49% of all the income losses. Um, and again, uh, the, the message there is recessions are bad for rich people. Um, but don't feel too bad for the 1%, because uh, immediately after the recession, the top 1% received 95% of all income gains in the first three years of recovery, which is all, all the years we have data for thus far. Um, the income gain for the 1% was 31%. The income gain for the 99% was 0.4%. Um, another way of saying this is that the 1% ate the recovery. Um, uh, yet another way of saying it is that this has been a members-only economic recovery, um, with, with the asterisk that I think things have gotten a little better distribution-wise since 2012. Uh, but even so, uh, uh, we have seen sort of wildly disproportionate um, uh, income gains go to the top 1% since the recession ended in 2009. Why is this happening? Remember Mr. Monopoly? It's happening because of capital accumulation. Uh, 
Thomas Piketty uh, made himself an unlikely uh, best-selling author this year with his publication of the book Capital in the 21st Century. Uh, Piketty was also the uh, economist who, along with Emmanuel Saez, really created this whole vocabulary of the 1% versus the 99%. In the early aughts, they published a paper, the two of them, that uh, uh, disclosed uh, really for the first time how dramatically um, uh, great an increase in uh, income share the 1% had experienced since 1979. Now, looking at this chart, uh, the, vertical uh, the vertical axis is income share for the top 1%, uh, and it, it's expressed in three ways. Total income, blue, uh, total income minus capital gains, orange, and total income minus capital income, that is wages only, red. Uh, let's focus on just the blue versus the red. The horizontal axis uh, covers the years 1910 to 2010. I know it's hard to read. Um, Focusing on that blue line and that red line. The blue trend, um, which again is um, total income, uh, is much more dramatic uh, than the, um, uh, sorry, uh, much more dramatic uh, than the, uh, the red. Um, and what that really shows is that this income divergence is really driven by a certain kind of income, and that is capital income. Uh, so again, to repeat, the rise of the 1% <clears throat> is attributable largely to capital, uh, which, uh, the way Piketty uses the term, means all types of wealth accumulation, not just uh, investments. It can also mean things like land. Um, it's attributable uh, the rise uh, of capital rather than the rise of wages, though wages are unequal uh, in the United States, too. Why is this happening? Uh, two very simple reasons. Uh, one is out-of-control pay increases for top executives and non-financial corporations. Um, and since the 19, early 1990s, uh, a major driving force there has been stock option awards. Um, uh, ironically, um, uh, this is a case of good intentions gone awry. When, when President Clinton uh, came into office, he had promised in the 1992 campaign that he would put a million dollar limit on the deductibility of CEO salaries. Um, and as it was explained to me by an expert in uh, uh, executive pay, uh, two things happened immediately. One, everybody got a raise to a million dollars who was a CEO. And the second thing that happened was that uh, uh, raises beyond a million dollars were suddenly given in stock option awards, um, which uh, companies actually refused to uh, uh, put on the books because they claimed they didn't know the value of these stock option awards. Well, when you don't put money you're spending on the books, you're likely to spend a lot more of it, and that's what happened. Um, my my uh, uh, source who, who told me about this said that when she was told that the, the, these stock options uh, had no value, uh, because they couldn't be valued. Her response was, great, can I have some? Um, so out of control executive pay is, is half the story. And the other half of the story is out of control growth in uh, the finance industry. And that's driven largely by the deregulation of uh, Wall Street. It's happened since the late 70s. And uh, uh, the simultaneous shift uh, in uh, investment banks from a partnership structure to a publicly owned corporate structure. In effect, uh, you saw that um, uh, investment banks were no longer spending their own money, they were spending other people's money and, uh, and had a, uh, uh, an expectation of government rescue should they get in trouble, as in fact did happen during the recession. Now, when we talk about the 
the 1% is actually a kind of verbal shorthand uh, for a different group, which is the 0.1%. That's where the action really is in terms of growing income share. Um, and this is a chart that shows uh, who these people are, the 0.1%. Um, and it shows who they were in 1979 and then in a number of subsequent years up to 2005. Um, the, uh, what you find is that um, non-financial executives were uh, represented about 48% in 1979, slipped a little bit, they represent about 43% uh, as of 2005. So they're a big part of the story. But look at financial professions. That's where you've seen a really big change. The composition of the 0.1% back in 1979 was um, about 11% of those folks were financial professions. By 2005, 18% uh, of them, 18% of that elite 0.1% uh, consisted of financial professions. Um, this is, you know, this chart really shows you uh, what the structure of the 1% the, um, uh, uh, versus 99% type inequality really is. Um, and sometimes you hear that inequality is being driven by celebrity artists and sports figures. Um, this is a fantasy. Yes, yeah, celebrity. Artists and sports figures make stupendous amounts of money, but there just aren't that many of them. Um, so they end up representing, uh, well, they were 2% in 1979, and uh, they're up to about 3% in 2005. So as you contemplate the causes of income inequality, um, don't waste a lot of time blaming it on celebrity basketball players. Now, so we have now reviewed the 1% versus the 99% story. Again, simple story. It's about uh, Wall Street deregulation, and it's about CEO pay spinning out of control. The second part of income inequality is the more complicated part, and this is where um, we start to hear about education. Um, I would give about equal weight to um, education in this part of the story and uh, the decline of labor unions. So what's going on? Uh, we're seeing stagnation at the middle of the income distribution. Uh, from 1979 to 2012, the median household income, which is currently about $53,000, increased 5%, while income for the top 10%, which is currently about 114,000, increased 77%. That's a pretty big disparity. Uh, back during the um, Great Compression, when uh, uh, incomes were becoming more equal, or at least remaining stable with respect to one another, when middle class, uh, when, when uh, wealthy incomes increased, middle class incomes increased by at least as much. Here, uh, you're seeing quite the opposite. You're seeing incomes at the top increasing much, much faster. Um, and, and by way of illustration, from 1950 to 1970, median household income grew by 63%. Um, median income today is about 4% lower than it was at the recession's end, about 5% lower than it was at the recession's start, and about 7% lower than it was in January 2000. Remember, as I tick off these figures, that uh, I'm talking about what's been happening uh, during an economic recovery. Now, these are all pre-tax figures, um, which means they don't include the effects of taxes and transfer payments. When you include those, you see a, a steady but nonetheless modest increase in the median. You sometimes hear people say that um, because of that, we don't have an inequality problem. Uh, uh, to which I would respond, first of all, it's a, it's a modest increase in the median. It's not anything to write home about. It's uh, nowhere near the 63% we experienced during the Great Compression. 
And uh, another thing I would point out is a lot of the people who uh, are interested in pointing this out are also interested in cutting the very uh, uh, income uh, uh, support programs that have um, made this modest increase possible. So why is this happening? Um, the usual suspects when we talk about inequality are actually innocent. Uh, when we're talking about the growth in income inequality, uh, actually, uh, when we're talking about either half of this problem, uh, the 1% versus the 99%, or uh, the spread between um, uh, skilled labor and uh, less skilled labor. Um, race and gender, first two things we tend to think about when we think about inequality. Uh, inapplicable in, 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 in any direct way here, uh, because the black-white pay gap today is virtually the same as it was in 1979, while the uh, gap between men and women is actually a little narrower. Um, now, full stop, particularly with respect to um, the black-white pay gap. Um, I don't mean to be at all breezy about the fact that we have not seen any improvement in the black-white pay gap since 1979. If I were to step into a time machine and go back to 1979, those of you who were around in 1979, I would walk up to you and I would say, a third of a century from now, we will see no improvement in the pay gap between African Americans and whites. You would say to me, I feel confident, you would say to me, I was out of my mind, that there was no way that that pay gap, the legacy of um, uh, historic racism uh, would, would persist. Um, well, it has persisted, and it's a serious problem. Um, however, uh, it is not a problem that is driving growing income inequality, because uh, we're not seeing this particular gap grow. Um, now, uh, it's been pointed out to me by a couple of people that um, race uh, is, is highly relevant in, in a more indirect way, which is that the uh, uh, country's uh, growing resistance to um, uh, the welfare state uh, is to a great extent reflective of uh, racial uh, uh, feelings that were stirred by the rise of the civil rights movement um, and that, that much opposition to um, uh, uh, government assistance is uh, motivated by um, uh, uh, prejudice against African Americans, even though African Americans uh, represent a minority of the people on public assistance. Um, so in that sense, race has affected the growth of income inequality. Uh, it's, it has made the country less willing to uh, um, uh, address income inequality through government assistance. Still, in, in no direct way has this, um, has this uh, income gap driven the growth in income inequality. Now, another usual suspect is immigration. Um, really good guess that immigration would be driving income inequality because uh, the United States greatly liberalized its immigration laws in 1965, and uh, it would be very logical that within a few years, um, the uh, growth in, uh, in immigration, which, is, uh, which certainly occurred, uh, would be creating more income inequality in the United States. Um, the problem with this theory is that you can't find any evidence for it actually having happened. The, uh, the only native-born group in the United States whose pay is driven down by immigrants is high school dropouts, and that's because the um, uh, the, the real surge in uh, immigration and undocumented immigration has uh, come from uh, 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 Latinos, principally uh, Mexicans, who lack a, uh, a high school degree. And so those folks are competing against native-born Americans who lack a high school degree. Uh, there has been a small impact on that group of native-born Americans, um, but uh, there has been uh, no real impact uh, measured elsewhere. And uh, remember that you know, when we're talking about income inequality, 
um, we are basically talking about the change in the relationship between the middle class and the affluent. Um, the, um, uh, you know, it, it, it was lousy to be poor in 1979, and it's lousy to be poor today. Uh, it is not appreciably more lousy relative to the middle class. Um, but it didn't used to be lousy to be middle class. Um, and now it kind of is, which is scary. Um, the final usual suspect would be trade. Um, and <clears throat> uh, you would think that as the United States was trading more, that um, that would put downward uh, pressure on um, incomes uh, for workers in the United States. Um, and that is true, but it's a very recent phenomenon. Um, until really the 21st century, the wages of the countries that the United States was trading with weren't really low enough to exert downward pressure on incomes for US workers. That changed in the 21st century with the rise of imports from China and particularly uh, from Mexico. Um, China, um, I'm sorry, with Mexico and particularly China. China's you know, one of these strange countries that it manages to be rich and poor at the same time. Um, it's, it's, uh, 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 GDP is growing like gangbusters, but um, actual incomes of its workers <clears throat> are extremely low. And what we would ordinarily expect to happen would be that as a country industrializes, the wages would come up. But it gets tricky when you've got a billion, when your population is one billion. Those wages are gonna come up a little more slowly in that case, and that seems to be happening in China. Um, So what are the causes for this? Uh, the decline of labor, I think, is a very significant cause. Um, the union density, which means the percentage of American workers who belong to unions, within the private sector workforce uh, was about 40%, uh, and today it's dropped to below 7%. Um, uh, union density in the private sector is about the same level as it was at the start of the New Deal. Uh, so when you look at um, the, the, the condition of unions in the private sector today, uh, it's, it's really as if the New Deal never happened. Um, when, I, when I contemplate this reality, I, I um, scratch my head at the persistence of um, the phrase big labor in our um, political discourse. Uh, there's nothing terribly big about it in the private sector. Um, and what caused this decline in labor? Well, we know all about globalization, which had some impact. Um, uh, labor is under siege in uh, industrialized countries around the world. But the decline has been much greater in the United States. And that, I think, has a lot to do with government policy. Um, the Taft-Hartley law was passed in 1947, um, making it much more difficult for uh, labor unions to organize. And uh, that had uh, kind of the effect of a sort of slowly dripping poison on the labor movement. It took a while for its impact to be felt because labor was at the peak strength uh, when, when Taft-Hartley was passed. But uh, by the 1970s, its effects were evident. Um, also in the 70s, congressional support for labor was weakening. And by the 80s, the Reagan administration, led by uh, the only president of the United States uh, in history who was himself a former labor leader. Uh, he was president of the Screen Actors Guild. Um, uh, but the Reagan administration was openly hostile to labor to a degree that was really unprecedented. Um, and we, we see that in the, in the PATCO strike when President Reagan fired a number of uh, 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 air traffic controllers who were striking, striking illegally to be sure, but they were striking and he fired them and replaced the entire uh, workforce of air traffic controllers. Um, the economist Richard Freeman of uh, Harvard, uh, uh, one of the leading labor economists in the country, has said that if the sole cause of um, the decline of uh, uh, labor were global trends, the average earnings for US industrial workers in 2005 would have been uh, about $25 per hour, uh, but uh, 
Instead, uh, they were about $16 per hour. And here you see that the income share for the top 10% has just sort of progressed in inverse proportion to um, union membership. Now let's get to education, which is uh, the star of the show here. Um, what's been happening in education since the 70s? Well, um, let's actually go back to the start of the 20th century. Uh, we had a revolution in the United States at the start of the 20th century uh, in, in high school uh, graduation rates. Uh, people didn't really start going to high school in the United States until the early part of the 20th century. Um, it wasn't until then that you really saw uh, uh, laws that, that made it mandatory for uh, kids to go uh, not just to grade school but to high school and where you saw adequate funding for um, those high schools to be maintained. Um, it was actually called a movement, the high school movement. We don't hear much about it today, but it, it, it was a real thing. It occurred in the late 19th and early 20th century, and it gave America this great gift of um, universal high school attendance, uh, uh, mandatory to the age of 16. Um, as a result of that, you see that, uh, well, it, well, actually that part of the um, trend isn't here on this chart, but if you go all the way back to 1900, you find that um, the overwhelming majority of Americans did not graduate from high school in 1900. By 1940, you see here, it was up to 51%. So that's a really rapid increase in the proportion of high school uh, graduates in the population. Um, and, uh, and then uh, it leveled off in the 70s, actually dipped a little bit, and then leveled off in the 70s at about 70%. Um, I should sort of add that this, this, when we're talking about the high school graduation rate here, we're not talking about the GED uh, uh, people with GEDs. We're talking about people who actually go to high school and graduate uh, who um, tend to be preferred by employers than people who get their GED. So what does that mean? It means that our supply of high school graduates uh, uh, was no longer rising as it had between 1900 and uh, about 1965. Um, what was happening in the economy during that time? The demand for skilled labor was rising and rising and rising. Um, going back to 1900, uh, uh, you know, we saw the most extraordinary changes in our economy that, that, that uh, the United States has ever seen before or since with the advent of electricity, um, and uh, any number of uh, other technologies that uh, just completely changed the economy permanently. Um, and one result of that was that uh, more uh, uh, technically skilled workers were needed, and um, uh, that meant more high school graduates were needed, and the supply of high school graduates rose to meet demand. Well, when you get to the 1970s and that level levels off, um, the demand for, for high school and, and by the mid-century uh, college graduates didn't stop growing, it kept increasing. And relative to demand, you see that uh, the supply of uh, uh, college graduates um, was no longer uh, meeting uh, demand. Um, And you know, again, that demand starting from the 1980s was created by the technological revolution brought about by computers. But it could have been, you know, sort of, it, that was a sort of not a particularly extraordinary new development that we had a, an increase in technological demands on workers. What, what was an extraordinary development was that for the first time in the 20th century, the supply of, uh, an educa uh, of educated workers, sufficiently educated workers, um, uh, was inadequate, and that created income inequality uh, in the form of uh, what's called the college premium, which is the amount of money that college graduates get relative to the rest of the population. Um, now, it's true that <clears throat> everywhere in the world, the more highly skilled workers make more money than less skilled workers, but what this chart uh, 
uh, shows, and this is from a, a paper by the MIT economist David Autor uh, in Science from this past May. What you see here is that the wage return on skills is much higher in the United States than it is in most comparable nations. Um, uh, we are um, you know, way at the bottom of that chart. You'll see that um, the return on skills is much, much greater in the United States than it is in places like Spain, Austria, France, um, Norway, Sweden. So it really matters much more in the United States whether you went to college than it does in other countries. And it matters everywhere. It just happens to matter more here. Um, but now the story gets complicated because we have this big college premium, but it stopped growing. Um, now, according to this chart, it stopped growing around 2000. Um, a lot of other people measuring it slightly differently say that it actually stopped growing back in the <coughs> mid-90s. Um, but no need to quibble there. What we can see is that there is a substantial gap between the earnings of college graduates and people who do not have a college degree, but that that gap stopped growing uh, uh, at some point 20 or, uh, 20 or so, maybe 15 years ago. Uh, now we're looking at hourly wages for college graduates. Look at the orange line, and you will see that, that um, the hourly wages for college graduates has only risen about 1% over the past decade. The more significant wage growth now for both men and women is the blue line, uh, and that represents wage levels for people who've gone to graduate school. Uh, what that shows is the college premium is becoming a graduate school premium, which poses a really difficult dilemma for policymakers because policymakers don't have much trouble saying we need to get as many people as we can through college. Um, but it's a pretty difficult challenge to get a huge proportion of the U.S. population through graduate school as well. Um, when we talk about education, we also talk about opportunity. And a number of people, when they are confronted with uh, the uh, arguments about income inequality, they say, well, I don't care about growing income inequality. Opportunity is what matters, and the United States is the land of opportunity. This chart says fairly loudly, no, it isn't. Um, U.S. income mobility has declined between the turn of the century and the 1950s and since then, it's leveled off. Now the US lags most other comparable nations in income mobility, a dramatic change from the early 20th century. What this chart measures is something I call income heritability, which is specifically the likelihood that, uh, that my children will inhabit the same place in the income distribution that I did. Um, they, my children, uh, should perhaps inherit my eye color uh, or my um, body type, they should not be inheriting my income. And yet, it's pretty clear that uh, they do and that we see more such heritability in the United States than in almost any other comparable nation. The only two countries that are worse are Italy and the United Kingdom. What effect does growing income inequality have on upward mobility? Um, this is something that President Obama has talked a lot about. Uh, sensing that people are more responsive to an argument about opportunity than about equality, um, the President has talked a lot about how growing income inequality threatens uh, upward mobility. Um, uh, the phrase he uses, borrowing it uh, from um, uh, a researcher at uh, the Brookings Institution, is it gets harder to climb the ladder when the rungs are further apart. Instinctively, that feels true. And um, uh, his, um, uh, in an economic report to the president in February 2012, we see this uh, documented spatially. We see that um, as the uh, uh, amount of income 
inequality goes up in a country, you tend to observe a higher uh, level of uh, uh, income heritability um, as well. Uh, income inequality, uh, higher income inequality means less mobility would be a simpler way of saying it. Um, that's when we look at lots of different countries. So the question is, what about the United States? Has growing income inequality in the United States uh, compromised upward mobility? Um, the answer, surprisingly, is not that we can tell so far. Um, there was a very ambitious study that was published last January um, that uh, basically said that um, mobility is about the same today as it was in the 1970s. Therefore, you can't say that growing income inequality has compromised upward mobility. Uh, what you can say is upward mobility in the United States, as I noted before, is nothing to write home about uh, compared to upward mobility in other comparable nations. But it hasn't gotten worse since the 1970s. You've actually seen the president shift his rhetoric a little bit ever since this study came out. Um, and uh, he is no longer saying that um, income inequality is, is killing upward mobility. He will, he will talk about the two things um, uh, together, but he will no longer make that causal connection because uh, we can't find that causal connection, uh, at least not temporally. Um, we can still find it geographically, as the, uh, that earlier uh, chart showed, in, across countries. You also see it across regions in the United States. Regions in the United States where you see greater uh, income inequality are also regions where you seem to find less upward mobility. So there is still a good reason to suspect that there is a link and that that link just hasn't been demonstrated yet. Um, what do we conclude? We conclude uh, three things. Uh, one is the 1% uh, versus the 99%. That part of the growth in income inequality has nothing to do with education. We also conclude that skill-based inequality is caused by uh, the decline of unions and also by a shortage of skilled workers relative to demand. Um, but we also find that that, <clears throat> uh, that shortage of skilled laborers that drives income inequality um, is, uh, has not been um, worsening since the mid-90s. Education continues to help uh, 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 ease income inequality, but it's, it's not enough. And um, you know, where does that leave us in terms of policies? Um, you know, that's, that's a question I think I'll address in, uh, in the questions and answers. But the sort of concluding point I would make is a college education uh, brings prosperity only relative to those who lack it. Uh, it isn't, at the moment, lifting wages. Thank you. Uh, but before, actually, before we go to questions, it suddenly occurs to me, I'd like to, if I can, that's my son and daughter, which uh, um, I wonder if I'm able to get this up here on the... Uh, Um, I don't know if I'll be able to do this. Never mind, I don't seem to be able to do it. Okay, we'll just go straight to questions. Someone who worked with data, okay. As you probably heard the, the saying, uh, in God we trust, everybody, everybody else brings data. <laughs> and uh, so that, uh, you know, it's very important to show us all the data, which I believe. But my question is not about the data, what you present, about what you have not presented today. Mm -hmm. Um, let me give you a bit of a personal encounter observation from three years ago. Uh, during the height of the Occupy movement, I was in Washington, D.C. Over the course of three days, I spent long hours at McPherson Square. Okay. And uh, it was fascin fascinating, not just because what I saw in the square, but also outside the square, uh, about people's reaction to what's going on. Okay. So I was over... Um, 
the second day, I was over on top of this balcony uh, in an apartment complex just overlooking uh, McPherson Square, all right? So during this time, uh, the National uh, Parks uh, uh, Rangers, they started to come in, okay? And to tear down, there was a, a wooden structure erected by the protesters, and which is a no-no for the park district, all right? So it started to tear down, and uh, on this balcony, uh, there were about a dozen or so um, yuppies. Um, over the course of the afternoon, they started to drink wine and beer and shouting to the folks downstairs, down in, in the square, go DCPD, go DCPD, go 1%, go 1%, okay. So this is fascinating because there are two mistakes made. Number one, this is not DCPD. This is because McPherson belongs to the National Park District. So that's a smaller mistake. The bigger one's more fascinating. And first of all, they do not belong to the 1%, right? Because as I know, a friend of mine uh, rents an apartment up there, so at most, middle, upper middle class, all right? And so um, whether or not that's a mistake is even more interesting. If they're not 1%, they made a mistake, or they knew they were not 1%. However, they believed they could make up to the 1%, all right? So my question is about public, the trends of public perception ideology. Also, there has been a divergence there, and where do we draw that cut? Seems to me which is much lower than the 1%, and that also lies a prob problem there. That's why we don't see a solution to what started over three years ago. Thank you. Um, well, I'd start by saying they, they might actually have been one percenters. The, the, uh, uh, you know, what's the cutoff for the 1%? Family income of about $380,000. It's conceivable. They weren't part of the 0.1 percenters who, uh, you know, as I said, were, they are the real problem. 1% is kind of a verbal shorthand for 0.1%. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, there, is, uh, there are cultural attitudes that are prevailing uh, that um, are uh, quite different from the kind of attitudes that prevailed say in the 1930s, which was the last sort of extended period of economic distress in the US, um, uh, obviously much worse then, and maybe that's why um, there was um, less of that kind of sneering on the part of uh, those who were better off. Um, I, think that, uh, I think that income inequality, one of the corrosive facts about income inequality is and this is all speculation on my part, but I think that it, it um, creates a more tribal society, more of a sense of us and them, more of a sense of separation. Uh, one thing I write about in my book is, you know, I, I don't think it's coincidental that since the late 1970s, you've seen um, much greater sort of sorting of the population, uh, much greater withdrawal of the more affluent into wealthy enclaves, often gated, um, uh, the, the kind of rise in gated communities since, since uh, 1979 has been off the charts. Um, and uh, I think you see it in, in, in the attitudes that uh, people of different classes have towards one another, this kind of uh, mutual contempt, which is just um, uh, a frightening thing to see happen in a democracy. Um, I think you see it in our politics. Uh, it's actually pretty well documented that <clears throat> as income inequality grows in the United States, you see more partisanship in Congress. And I've seen a couple of studies that show the level of partisanship in Congress today, which exceeds the level of partisanship measured in terms of, and this is measured by votes in the House of Representatives, exceeds the amount of partisanship during the period of Reconstruction. So stop and think about this. People in the House of Representatives during Reconstruction, who just a few years earlier had been shooting at each other, um, uh, can find uh, more common ground than, uh, than people in the House of Representatives today. That's a, that's a really alarming fact. Um, so yes, I, I think that, that you do see um, uh, less of a sense of e pluribus unum in the United States, and that's corrosive to our politics and our society in, in a million ways that I think we all encounter every day.
Hi, thank you for this very compelling discussion. My name is Venera, I'm a uh, faculty at School of Social Work, and I'm wondering, since my research focuses on immigrants, uh, what can, uh, is there something about the immigration policy that influences the uh, income inequality? Um, well, uh, as I said in the presentation, it, 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 it's a logical connection to make that, that, that just has never been demonstrated, that, 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 that the growth in uh, immigration in the U.S. has been driving the growth in income inequality. There's just kind of no evidence to support it. The only group um, that, uh, the only native-born group that has really uh, suffered in terms of income uh, by uh, immigration are high school dropouts in the United States, a pretty small group, um, and, and the, even the impact on them has not been um, uh, hugely great. Um, the other thing that, uh, you know, when I look at the immigration debate, I have to say I scratch my head a little bit because if you look at the numbers, and as you can see, I like to look at numbers, um, uh, the, the um, uh, number of uh, uh, undocumented immigrants coming to the United States has fallen over the last decade. Um, and, you know, it was falling before uh, the recession. And that appears to be, nobody knows too much about this, but it appears to be because uh, of improvement in the economy of Mexico. Um, so uh, this kind of nightmare vision that, that politicians talk about, about sort of, uh, the United States being overrun by undocumented uh, aliens, it it's, doesn't seem to be happening. I mean, there are obviously isolated instances like the uh, like the um, uh, uh, Central Americans who were coming, uh, the, the, the kids who were coming across the border um, a few months ago. But um, uh, the big picture is that uh, growth in undocumented immigration uh, seems to have stopped. So why is this the subject of such passionate um, uh, uh, argument? I, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I was just wondering, in terms of the skill base of the immigrants that come to this country, any uh, about that? Right. Well, the skill level has been very low, and that's why the main competition has been with high school dropouts. And you get into a gray area when you talk about things like construction, which is you know sort of semi-skilled labor and often unionized labor. And I have heard you know reports in certain isolated places anyway, that, that, that that's starting to um, really kind of undermine labor contracts. Um, so, you know, you could probably find places where there is an impact, but so far nationwide, nobody has been able to observe a national impact. Third row. Hi. Um, oh, we all have a perception of, of you know, the policies that are being made in Washington that favor that 0.01% and make the rich richer. Um, it, you know, you're able to see over a long period of time, has, has that, is that getting better that the policies are decreasing that inequality or are the politicians just making more policies that make the rich richer? Um, I would say two things. I would say that, um, since 1979, the general trend in government has been um, uh, towards policies that uh, uh, create more income inequality in a million different ways. Um, uh, and I think uh, labor policy, as I mentioned, has been a big part of it. Um, we've seen uh, tax policy has been a factor, certainly. You know, remember when Ronald Reagan got elected, the top marginal rate was 70%. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's dropped you know, down to less than 40%. Um, and, and, and it was uh, like, uh, uh, you know, sort of, uh, it, was Sisyphean, uh, it was a Sisyphean task on, on Obama's part just to get it up to back to 39%. Um, uh, the Fed for a long time was so spooked by the, uh, the um, inflation of the 1970s that um, it really didn't uh, pay a lot of attention to the unemployment rate. That changed under Ben Bernanke after this recession. Um, so the general trend has been towards uh, policies that, that uh, have created greater income inequality, I believe. And I think you, you can put a lot of the blame 
uh, on the federal government. That said, um, uh, we've, uh, we've had some uh, moments when things have gotten better, and they've tended to be when uh, Democrats were in office. Um, uh, certainly things got better under Bill Clinton, uh, 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 at least for, um, uh, well actually the, the, the relationship between the middle and the top didn't get much better under Clinton, but the relationship between the poor and the middle class did get better, uh, thanks largely to the expansion of the earned income tax credit. Um, and today, you know, under Obama, we are seeing a somewhat revitalized labor department, um, a somewhat revitalized uh, National Labor uh, Relations Board. For a long time, Congress wouldn't even uh, let their, uh, let, uh, give uh, President Obama a quorum on the NLRB, so it couldn't uh, sort of rule on questions of whether um, uh, people trying to organize were having their uh, rights violated by management. Um, so it's been an uphill struggle, uh, I think, for the Obama administration. We've seen some improvement um, uh, in the policies. We haven't seen any imp real improvement, though, in the numbers. And I think that's because the accumulation of, of three decades uh, of growth and income inequality, uh, you know, it's, it's like trying to turn around a battleship. And um, I think it'll be uh, a while before we start to see um, in, in the data, sort of positive uh, improvements. Um, one really significant change that Obama has brought about uh, will uh, be an invisible one, and that is Obamacare. Um, we're, uh, it's going to be hard to sort of measure, but Obamacare really is uh, the most meaningful uh, government policy promoting equality that we've seen in this country since Lyndon Johnson. Um, but um, it's, it's not, it's not going to be easy to measure in things like income data. Um, but it is uh, a big change. Question, third row in the middle. Um, I wanted to ask about the college premium that you talked about. Um, it was, so I wanted to get your opinion on whether or not the rise in um, Income or the growth in income for bachelors and masters uh, receiving people is due to the uh, skill um, actually needing the the actual labor needing skills that are equivalent of bachelors and masters education levels, or if our education department in general has uh, failed in that we've lost kind of uh, what a high school diploma really should be valued at um, back when people were getting high school diplomas and were living middle class lives. Have we have has our education policy not caught up uh, so that people getting bachelors should see kind of the same increases that maybe a master's level is getting today? Uh, uh, before I answer, can you wave your hand? I, I can't. Oh, there you are. Oh, okay. Sorry. I didn't see you. Um, I think uh, both things are true. I think that there is greater demand for skilled labor. I also think that there has been a, um, uh, a kind of inflation in, in um, uh, uh, I don't know if you'd call it inflation, but uh, the, uh, you learn fewer skills in high school today, I think, than you did 50 years ago. Um, uh, my uh, grandfather never um, progressed beyond eighth grade, and uh, yet he managed during uh, the first half of the 20th century to lead a reasonably uh, decent life as a member of the middle class, maybe lower middle class. I'd say middle class probably. He was a foreman in a factory. And his eighth grade education, you know, sort of did him just fine. Um, I don't think he would have done nearly as well in the second half of the 20th century. My uh, late wife uh, was a college dropout, and she had a very successful career as a writer uh, at the Washington Post and Vanity Fair and a number of other places. Um, but she was a, a, a college dropout. Uh, she entered the workforce in the 70s. Where she had some connections that, that, uh, in publishing that helped her. Um, but, you know, if she were trying to do that today, I don't know. I mean, she might have trouble getting hired as a barista at Starbucks. Um, there's much more credentialism uh, than there used to be. And, um, uh, you know, 
the question of whether, you know, wh what I, I know for certain is that the, mar the, the marketplace demands uh, a college degree and increasingly a graduate degree. Um, uh, whether that demand is rational is a whole separate question. Um, you know, uh, I think uh, to some extent, you know, uh, America's universities have, have become America's personnel department. Um, and uh, that's, uh, you know, uh, if you graduated from college, what that really tells a potential employer is that you can show up in time and, uh, you know, have certain habits that are relatively reliable. Um, but uh, I don't think they tell bosses a whole lot more than that. Um, and, um, uh, but obviously that said, there are many fields that, that uh, require uh, more, um, a higher level of skills. And, you know, that, that's not uh, uh, an imaginary thing. Um, we do need a more highly educated workforce. Uh, whether we need as highly an educated workforce as the marketplace demands, you know, I think probably an eighth grade education will make you a perfectly fine barista at Starbucks. Marie. Um, can you talk a little bit about the trends you're seeing in terms of wealth accumulation and the cost of college education and the debt that students are being asked to take on in order to achieve this for what some call questionable returns? So yeah. sort of link uh, the discussion around the college debt question. Right. Well, part of what's happening is that, that it, it, you know, tuitions have climbed to unreal um, levels. Uh, I wrote a piece back in 1983 saying um, about tuition inflation back in 1983 uh, titled Highbrow Robbery. I was very proud of that headline. And um, uh, I basically said, this can't last. Um, something's got to give. Uh, and, you know, today I can tell you it lasted. I've got two kids in college um, and their combined tuitions exceed my income. Um, the, the, uh, since 83, the, the actual uh, cost of uh, college tuition has doubled. Now, it gets complicated because, uh, you know, not everybody pays sticker price, et cetera. And yes, I concede that, that um, uh, there are uh, sort of subtleties to this uh, uh, situation. But th the objective fact is that there are more and more kids who just can't afford to go. Um, and uh, even when student aid is available, because uh, you're taking on such debt that even if you get a job uh, after you graduate, uh, you are uh, um, going to spend many years in debt. And if you don't complete uh, college and therefore don't get the, um, the, the benefit of that college premium, then you're really screwed. You've got all this debt and yet you don't get the advantage of the college degree. Um, so, uh, you know, I really do think it's an unsustainable situation. And um, I think student loans will not remain an effective uh, uh, way to pay for college education. I also think we're going to see um, some real pressure, downward pressure placed on um, colleges and universities to um, uh, 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 restrict their tuition increases. Uh, the president has already started talking about it in a vague way. Um, but, um, you know, it, it just seems uh, it's an impossible situation right now. And the impact on wealth accumulation of the next generation. Pardon me? There'll be an impact of wealth accumulation and an ability to participate in the labor force on the current graduates with all this debt. Yes. Uh, well, uh, actually, I don't know what the relationship is between debt and ability to participate in the labor force. Um, wouldn't necessarily make it harder for you to participate in the labor force. It would make it harder for you to live on what you're making while you're in the labor force. Uh -huh. um, you know, uh, it could, could be a driver of income inequality uh, in the future, for sure. Thank you very much for your very thoughtful analysis. Uh, on the one point, which was your number one in your conclusions, the relation of <clears throat> higher education to inequality, uh, I wonder if you'd comment on the fact 
that is well established that those with a college education save a larger percentage of their income at each income level and those with a college education also are known well to manage their assets better. They don't put them into uh, <laughs> savings accounts which get 0.0001%, but instead they, you know, put them into an S&P 500 index fund or something like that. And, and uh, the compound interest then, Mr. Miller, uh, who uh, paid for MillerCom is an exception, <laughs> but he certainly is a kind of a dramatic example of what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm not kind of familiar with that data, but um, you know, it's, it's uh, I guess I would say correlation doesn't necessarily imply causation. It could just be that um, wealthier people manage their money better because um, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the sort of same qualities uh, in them that, uh, that, that made them uh, uh, get wealthy, um, those same habits helped them manage their money. Um, I don't think the fact of going to college necessarily would, uh, would be a determinant there. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think it is generally true that the, the, high, the more educated people tend to, uh, uh, you know, sort of have better health habits, um, better habits of all kinds. Um, you know, I'd say part of that probably is it's, it's sort of easier to maintain good habits when um, you are uh, a, a little more comfortable economically. You, 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 you actually have time to think about such things when you don't, when you're, you're really struggling. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, uh, um, I don't really, I guess I don't really believe that college would actually teach you to manage your money better. If so, uh, I should demand a refund from Harvard because, uh, well, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> well, I'd like to thank him for a very interesting presentation.